Welcome to another interview with South African authors. And uh, today I have Ian Johnston and Trevor Nell, who have co-written a book called The Fixer. And uh, it's not about fixing your brain, it's, it's about fixing your business. And so it's a very business focused conversation, although I don't think it's going to be dry and boring. I think sometimes we, we think about business as, uh, you know, this very um, yeah, dry, dry topic. Uh, and I don't think there could be a dry word out of Ian and Trevor. Uh, they, they are, I've worked with both of them over a long period of time. And uh, so it's, it's, and it's an absolute, um, uh, I want to say delight, but um, I'm not sure that's the word to describe it either. <laughs> we certainly have fun and we do business. And, uh, and so I look forward to just spending a bit of time with Ian and Trevor. And maybe Ian, we can start with you. Both of you have uh, huge creds when it comes to doing business. You've been in business and done business over a number of years. And um, I can even see a little bit of gray hair sticking out of Trevor's cap. And uh, so I, I thought of, you were going to talk about Ian's grey hair. Yes, <laughs> both. <laughs> so, uh, Ian, tell us about your business experience. Well, I'm not sure how far you want me to go back, but certainly the last 18 years I've been in consulting, mainly business strategy, uh, sales activity management, sales management and relationship management, principally the, around those kind of areas. I'm not a financial guy, so I haven't really delved into any of the financial side of, of business strategy. Um, it's really all about, um, for me to try and understand somebody's business, understand what they're doing, um, what they want to achieve, and what is the process in order for them to get kind of where they are now to where they need to be. Prior to that, um, I was in the corporate world. I, I introduced, my partner I introduced Irons and You Can Do Pet Foods into South Africa. We brought that into a fairly big brand and uh, the business was sold to Procter & Gamble. And then I was with a P&G for a couple of years before I decided that corporate world wasn't exactly for me. And as an entrepreneur to fit into corporate world was quite tough. And that was when I made the bold decision that I was going to go into this consulting field and um, stepped off the, the corporate ladder into this entrepreneurial world thinking it's going to be absolutely wonderful and rosy interesting 18 years and along the way I bumped into Mr. Nell and and then in one of his ventures and um, yeah so really that's really my my history in very short last 18 years or so. Thanks thanks Ian uh, Trevor, we could spend half an hour talking about all the businesses that you've been involved in. So give us the pricey version of, of Trevor's business life. Oh, my goodness. Uh, a good couple of years trying to get out of matric um, was really a struggle. Spent a good couple more years on the beach. Um, and then I bumped into my wife and realized that if I wanted to keep her because she was a hottie down in Durban and uh, all the boys were chasing her and she said if I didn't settle down it'd be trouble so I had to open up a business um, and I opened up a real estate operation of my own because no one would employ me I don't know why I'm I'm such a good guy um, just and um, that really translated into uh, seeing a couple of opportunities in, in teaching people how to invest in the stock market uh, down in, in Natal. I managed to secure the franchise rights to a, a college that was just starting up in Joburg. Um, that converted into an opportunity to start teaching people up in Joburg how to invest in shares. I then ended up at the stock exchange uh, working with brokers. Uh, a company sort of headhunted me and I got 30% of management control of Academy of Learning. I grew that into the largest private sector education franchise in the country. 
sold that out about 18 months later, made a killing, then got involved in various uh, positions, uh, advising 12 different listings. Um, uh, and, and so it went on and on and on. I developed a protected investment fund into a 2.1 billion total transaction value fund, created a publishing company called It's So Simple, uh, tried not to work too much and launched the Lonial Security Initiative, which is well over a billion rand now. Um, and I just tired of meeting old thoughts and I met a guy by the name of Ian Johnson, who had a great future behind him. So we thought, well, look, uh, both of us have got a great future behind us. Uh, uh, why don't we just share a couple of ideas? And, and I love this guy's stories and how he operated. And we decided to get together and, and publish a book. He's done a few books um, and is busy increasing his line. And I had written a book called Confessions of a Serial Entrepreneur. I, that's a pricey of uh, quite a few things. I've forgotten a few, Ian. Um, you'll remind us, I'm sure. Yeah, so, I mean, that's just by way of saying these are are two men who have been there, done that, might have a little bit of experience under the belt and, uh, and then come together uh, to write uh, the fixer, simple ideas to grow your business. And then I love this next line, how to surprise your competitors and double your income potential with business lessons that really work because uh, you've actually practiced this in the trenches. So um, that's, that's what I really uh, appreciate. And, and I want to come back to the simple ideas, simple ideas to grow your business, because it's something that you constantly come back to in the book. This is simple. It's simple. Um, come back to simplicity. And, and so why is that such an important aspect of what this book is about? Um, if I can just, um, in my, in, in the first book, the first of the Fixer series, which was the Fixer Managing in the Middle, um, I wrote the book primarily around junior and middle management, um, because I found they were the most important people in business. Um, I had a, a thing called the Organizational Effectiveness Triangle, which originated from an idea that Trevor actually had, which was called, um, what is it B? What is it, Chip? What is it? Um... Uh, my goodness. Yeah, you come back to me, Ian. Uh, phone me uh, and I'll call uh, a friend. <laughs> it, was, um, it was basically a, a triangle where you've got the business, um, the organization, and the customer. It's so MEC, my organization. Me, yeah. so, the business, and the consumer. MEC, correct. So my version of that was um, on the one side of the triangle, you've got the business. On the other side, you've got the customer. <clears throat> and the third, quite a, the third side of the triangle is the people in the business. And junior middle management, I said, fitted right in the middle because they're the closest to all three of those particular components of business. And, and in business today, and from my own corporate, limited corporate experience, um, you know, we all have access to information. So we're actually inundated with information. So what we find is junior middle management particularly are just managing information. And whilst technology is really important in today's world, there's no question about that. And COVID has certainly shown us how important and valuable it is to communicate and do business. Um, I think that you've got, to, you've got to let technology do what technology does and you've got to let people do what people do. And when you start losing the people element, then things start falling pear shape. You know, it's like aircraft today, modern technology allows this airplane to fly on its own pretty much. But when something goes wrong, um, you need somebody there that can actually just do something about it. So that was really the, the idea I had was the fact that it was, it was important that we go back to basics. We try and, 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 and go back to, you know, keep it simple. How many times do we hear that? And how many times do we just, we just say it? It's like any word or phrase it just becomes part and, part, of our, part and parcel of the way we communicate. But what does that actually mean? And, um, you know, if you 
go down to the basics, to the foundation of things, you find it's, I think it's a lot easier to find the solutions than scrambling through all this technology, trying to run your business and run your life based on this technology. So that's really what my, my sort of background, which really fitted, I think a lot with what Trevor was doing. I mean, his, his publishing business, it's so simple was based on exactly the same thing, but you can achieve a hell of a lot if you just keep it simple. And, and Trevor, for you, I mean, this simple, this word simple is something that you, you really have imbibed into how you do business and the way you constantly bring things back to, to keeping it simple. Why is it important to you? Well, it's quite simple. I can't count past three. So I try and keep things at one, two, three. After that, I can't really understand the concepts. Um, but no, and in fact, that's, that's why I really enjoyed Ian and collaborating with Ian because um, Ian straddled between the corporate and entre entrepreneurial uh, plays as a, as a business strategist. Uh, and for me, an absolute specialist in, I think, one of the most critical aspects of business, that is sales. Um, and this thing of simple was really conversion of um, uh, understanding that business is not easy. Uh, it's, it's really, it can be complex, uh, but you've got to remove the complexities into simple things. So if you force yourself to actually try and, from a strategic perspective, identify the simple top three priorities in every sphere of business and don't go too far past that and you focus on those then you can knock down one two three those are the most important things to do today and and really in in the challenge of most businesses is why they call consultants in or why they call the so-called experts in is because they're not really making the money that they want to be making. Um, so, so if if you just peel everything back, you'll find that people have concerns about revenue. Uh, and then, if you ask, well, why you as a corporate operation are not generating the revenue? It's in the main, you can go and have a look. It's because your salespeople or your marketing people or uh, they they're not out doing the same things they used to be doing or they're overthinking things so they're sitting in office meetings for three weeks out of four uh, trying to work out well what's happening here meanwhile uh, your competition is out in the marketplace and they've got an effective sales force out there they penetrate in the marketplace uh, and they're making things work it's, it's just that simple and ian knows how to actually convey that from what's required on the ground to what the management needs to understand about getting your people off their backsides and out into the marketplace. Ian's very good at that. Nice, nice. Thank you, thank you. And I think that you, I think what you, what is really helpful about the book is that you, you do this peeling away uh, to say, okay, this is actually the core principle here. This is actually, uh, as you say, Ian, the, the getting back to basics. And uh, I think it also, you also say, well, you know, business is simple. The, 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 the principles of how business works is, is actually not that complicated. It's people that actually complicate everything. <laughs> we, and, and, and this, you know, use this word, Trevor, overthinking. And, uh, you know, we, we do have a talent for that uh, and, and complicating our own lives. So it is a good reminder. And I think your book is really good at helping us to, to separate out all the, the chaff and to get down to the nuggets. Uh, that are really, really important. Uh, and one of the simple principles that I saw were this, these two percent. It was one percent and two percent. Uh, and I think this comes, you've got stories around this. What is one percent? What is the story around one percent and two percent? Why are um, it's It's one percent and two degrees. Oh, um, oh, well, you yeah. see, I, I, I overcomplicated it, or maybe oversimplified it, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Two degrees, oh, two numbers. 
See, I can't even count up to three, Trevor. They, uh, they're just lovely stories. Uh, you've got to hear this. And, the, you know, the 1% rule is not new. I mean, the 1% rule, you can Google it, and there are many. There's, in fact, a book, I can't remember the author, called The 1% Rule. So there are many different uh, versions of the 1%. It's used in a number of different industries and goes right back to, to the ancient Greeks. You know, they, they worked out mathematical equations. And the way they did things was to take whatever the equation, whatever the problem was, and break it up into small little pieces and then look to improve each piece by 1%. And the fact that you're focusing on that little piece means that you end up focus, increasing it by more improving it by more than 1%. So if you look at sales, you look at simplistically at, at you know, doing a presentation or, or um, you've got to get your basics right. You've got to understand exactly what it is you're going to say to somebody. Your preparation, your planning, all these simple things. You're saying, well, I'm actually going to go and see that person. Now, what, how do I break down this, this presentation to somebody or this meeting with somebody? What are the little things that I need to focus on and improve on? And it doesn't matter what you've got in life, whatever your problem is, break it down to little pieces and then look to improve the one piece, the one piece and then move on to the next. One, 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 one. <clears throat> it's it Trevor's one, two, three aspect. And the two degree rule was from when I was, when I learned to fly and get my pilot's license, I had to go on a country, go on a cross country flight um, prior to me qualifying. And um, those were the days before GPSs. We plotted our, our course on a map. We knew exactly where our line crossed certain areas and, <clears throat> and, and, um, and, and areas that we could identify and landscape areas. And I took off and after about 20 minutes, I knew where I should have been. <clears throat> and it was up in Durban and there were some masts up in, up in, in Hillcrest. And I knew that they, they were there because I'd flown around that area so many times. And when I got there, I kind of saw them, but I, I felt now I'm a little bit further away from them than I should be. But I thought, oh, not to worry, I'll be all right. I kept on flying. Now, when you fly an airplane, you can't pull over to the side of the road and ask somebody for directions. So the end result was that I ended up going off course because when I set my compass, in, when I took off in Durban, I was two degrees out. And I wasn't paying attention to wind speeds and all this sort of stuff. And obviously what happened is I started drifting off course. So if you look at a compass and you look at the middle of a compass and you try and identify two degrees, you can't see it. But if you go to the, the circumference of the, of the compass, the two degrees, the lines marking the two degrees is now significantly wider. And that's what happens in business. Everything we have in the business, we have a two degree moment. When the information is telling us something, and we choose to ignore it. So I chose to ignore it and then suddenly realized that I was way off track. And fortunately, I was able to pick up some, some landmarks and get back. In fact, I followed the, N, the N3 back to where I should have been. So I was very lucky. But um, that I called it the two degree moment because as I said, in business, sales is a typical example. You know, we're three weeks into the month, we haven't got our sales targets. We say to ourselves, oh, it'll be fine. We've still got another week to go. That's a two degree moment. You don't do something. You don't change the direction you're heading in. And of course you end up off course. And it's often in most cases, very difficult to get back to where you should have been before you can move forward again. Um, so that's where the two degree rule um, originated from. Really, really significant uh, and so easy to remember. I think that's the beauty of simplicity mm -hmm. is that uh, it, 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 it clicks in your mind and so you can go back to it and it just becomes this point of reference that you're able to come back to over and over again. And the two things, the 1% and the two degrees, uh, you know, it's like, I get that. And they are so applicable in business, uh, how I can improve and how I can grow and how I can address problems so they don't grow bigger than they already are. Yeah. And, I mean, and, I, I found that, that, that those two fitted very well in with, fitted in very well with Trevor's, um, you know, 
his his ebook that he'd written about the um, confessions of a serial entrepreneur, because if you know look at the at the at the foundation and the structure of that book, that's all come from Trevor's um, serial entrepreneur book. So it fitted very well in because if you look at all those those principles that Trevor talks about and was in his book, they're all those basic things and the one percent and the two degree will really just fine tune what's already there because when you read it all, all the stuff trevor talks about you know you read it and you say to yourself gee well okay i understand that's yeah okay i've heard that all before but as you said in the book you know all the musical notes were invented before mozart came along yet he was able to produce the most incredible music with the same notes that were available to everybody and the same thing is you read the fixer and you might say oh, well i've heard that oh i know that but the fact is have you applied them because if you go back to basics, you keep it simple and you say, well, actually, I know all about that. I've read that all before, but now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to try and apply that. And suddenly by the application, the action, you get the results as opposed to the theory, because we've all got so much theory out there. And you, you know, if I can just come in here, this is what excites me about what Ian has done throughout his business life, as far as I'm concerned. Um, too many people theorize about business and they go after their degrees and their MBAs and all this sort of thing. Now, I'm jealous because uh, <laughs> I've got none of those things, um, but they don't apply it into the real world. And, and for me, Ian's genius was interpreting, and it was and is, uh, interpreting simple messages and, and really the key to, to what Ian has identified is the most important um, process of building a successful business is measuring. Uh, so you set your targets, uh, you work out what you're gonna monitor, you manage, uh, measure the process, uh, or the progress, and you make certain that you check in against ratios, you check in against uh, whether it's uh, too, too variable, a variable, or whether it's on track. Um, and, and as I'm sitting here listening and, and just rethinking what's going on, I think, I think the global economy and the world of business has had a smack on the side of the head, and it's never going to be the same again. And some people are sitting back in hibernation thinking, oh, we'll just wait until uh, it all gets better in a couple of weeks. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. And what Ian has just brought up for me again is the simplicity of turning around and saying, you know what, if you go back to basics, it means that you can go and look back over the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, ideas that you've got sitting on your shelves that you never brought off the shelves and re-look at them from a basics perspective. And, and that is, um, what have I got on my shelves that offers value to people and how can I share it with them at minimal cost and maximize a return um, in terms of profit back? Ian, you sparked that thought in me, and I think that's another little book here, what to do post-COVID. Uh, and this is getting back to basics. Have a look at what's on your shelves. Uh, sorry, Lee, I, I, I'm planning the next, the next book. We could do something quite simple here. I'm excited about that. Yeah, I agree. I think that, um, you know, this measurement thing is, again, it's such an overplayed word, but, you know, the question is, you know, what do you want to measure? What do you need to measure? Why are you measuring it? And what are you going to do with the information? If you can't answer those questions, because what I want to measure versus what I need to measure couldn't be two different things. And, 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 and once you, it's like this dog chasing a car, you know, it's a hell of a lot of fun chasing the car, but once they catch the car, they say, well, now what do I do with it? And this, this whole thing about this information overload, because at a press of a button, we can pretty much measure anything we want. And um, why are you measuring it? What are you going to do with the information? And if you're not going to do anything with the information, then for goodness sake, don't measure it. And, and I think that Trevor's right. This, this period of time, I've spoken to so many people over this period of time, because that's what I do every day, pretty much. And I'm absolutely amazed whether they want to pursue the opportunity I'm talking about or not, that's, that's irrelevant. But in the conversation, it's interesting that they, they saying, no, I'm not interested. 
But when you start talking to them about what they're doing, they, they've been retrenched or they've had this problem, that problem. And I'm saying, well, okay, even if you don't want to pursue my opportunity, what are you doing? What are you going to do? I can see this. I can see this two degree moment in talking to these people. And I'm saying, well, you're getting some information in front of you every single day that's telling you, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> and yet they're carrying on and they're saying, well, this, well, that. And it, it is, it, it's, it's concerning because there are so many opportunities out there, but you've got to, as Trevor says, you've got to kind of reset. You've got to go back and look around you and say, what information have I got? Goodness me, I press a button, I can get the information I want. What do I actually want to do? And sadly, desperation um, will get people clutching at straws and not, may not necessarily be going down the right road because they, they're so desperate. But if they stop, just get back to basics, reset, rethink, speak to people, get some clarity on some ideas uh, and take this time, um, then they can reset and, and refocus. I think the big, big key word is focusing on something. Um, and, and then as you say, Ian, apply, do something about it, actually get on. Yeah, Trevor, you, I used to, you, you sorry, used to I just, add something. I just said, I, I, we used the analogy in the book about crossing the river. And it came from when I was a kid, we used to go and play in the bush and we had this river near us and we would sit on the banks of the river and dare each other to see who could cross the river without getting their feet wet. And the winner, if you fell in the water, then you had to buy everybody else a Coke and a Crunchy, which was a lot of money in those days. But you know, when you're sitting on the river bank, you say, okay, I can step on that stone, I can step on that rock. And so you plot your course across the river until you get into the middle of the river and the view that you now have is very different to the one you had there. But it's, if I want to get to the other side of the river, what's the first step I have to make? Okay, I can go onto that rock. I can't go onto that one because it's too far away. And it's just step by step by step. But people get so caught up in the motion of wanting to do things and we live in this microwave society. You know? Press the microwave two minutes and it's cooked that they want to get to the other side of the river, not realizing that's the process that they need to follow and they need to measure their, their progress to see whether they're actually staying on course or not. And it's, yeah, it's just keeping it simple. Trevor, sorry. Another great, great story. Trevor? Uh, well, I was just going to jump, jump in here. Ian, Ian also reminds me um, of why we worked so well together here, is that um, Ian comes across very much so as a, uh, He's the state, you know, nice collar and tie, corporate <laughs> man and the whole titties. Uh, but, but let me tell you, he reminds me that business is about having fun and not having this super big ego about yourself. It's about actually breaking all those things down. Uh, and this, this right in the middle of COVID here in South Africa is when Ian brings up how people are being retrenched and businesses are closing down um, and all those particular challenges. Uh, Ian's particular skill here, I believe, is to get people to recognize the acres of diamonds that are sitting right under their noses that can actually be relaunched again. They can focus on their bread and butter income and then they can have a look at one or two other business strategies and they can take all that past experience and skill and they can ramp up opportunities with the other um, where they want to enter into. And that's what we're going to have to do now. We're going to have to multitask uh, as entrepreneurs. We're going to have to in invest in a couple, of field, a couple of fields. But you don't want to take five years to do that. <laughs> you, you, you want yeah. to actually start using some of your skills to actually try and make some very savvy uh, decisions very quickly. Uh, and that's where Ian can actually help because all the basics are in place and he understands it from a corporate and a highly entrepreneurial perspective. I just wanted to, oh, oh, please, can I share with him the sort of fun that we have? Um, you know, we've, we've been out uh, working on projects and, and I once had a little baby with me um, <laughs> uh, driving around because my family was all stuck and I think I had a little four-month-old baby. Do you remember that, Ian? Uh, and for some reason, I needed, I needed a driver. And Ian happened to be <laughs> the poor guy sitting. Maybe we were talking about a book uh, or whatever. 
And Ian drove me down. I, do you remember that, Ian? Where was that? Kempton Park. And we were yeah, having was, a, board, a boardroom yeah, meeting. Um, ex, um, ex South African cricketer. That's I don't right. remember his name. Pinot. Yeah. Roy. Right. Roy Pinot, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, Roy headed up uh, quite a large, I think he was the MD of that operation. Yeah. And, and we were doing a big deal in, in Soweto. Uh, and Ian put us together. Uh, and so we entered into the boardroom. I'd never met Roy. I, I don't know if Ian had. And we walked into the boardroom. And I think there might have been one or two of their directors around. And little baby decided, four-month-old baby decided, no, well, now is the time to introduce all her insights to the rest of the world. <laughs> so, so while Ian was calmly sitting there talking to the people about business, I was changing the nappy on the boardroom. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, beautiful. And, and, and it's about having fun. And, and they loved it. Uh, and uh, I remember they took us on a tour of their place. They couldn't believe it. Man, we did deals. Uh, if you remember there with Nedbank, uh, I think when she was about four weeks old, this little one uh, walking around with her. Uh, but there are other funny stories I've had with Ian. One, uh, maybe we'll get into hawking coffins at some stage. But uh, Lee, I know you oh. wanted to ask a really savvy <laughs> question. I don't know if I've got a savvy answer for you. Well, <laughs> I think what I really, I mean, anybody that's going to be listening to this is already going to have got some gems. And uh, thinking about what, especially uh, you started talking about having fun, Trevor, but just before that, you were thinking specifically around what is it that people can do now? Uh, because I think people, uh, Ian, you're getting frustrated that people maybe aren't seeing opportunities uh, and, and Trevor, you're excited about opportunities. Uh, and so tell us a bit about that. I mean, there are people who are sitting at home or, uh, you know, they, they're in a place of despair, many people, uh, either because they've lost jobs or because their businesses have collapsed. Maybe their whole industry has collapsed. And they're looking for where to from here. And, mm. and what, what is your answer? What is it that you can... Well, look, uh, so, so I'm going to tell you, I believe 99.99% .99 of the people who have been affected by COVID right now that are absolutely depressed and demotivated um, are completely lost. Um, that, that we have got a big problem unless we actually get to see where our real assets lie. And, and we have a conversation between ourselves uh, in our networks. Whatever thought is coming into your head right now, where you are, are, have tons of negative information all around you, I mean, it's, it's all around you. Um, whatever thought is coming out of there, if you are not feeling positive, you're probably coming up with the wrong answer. Okay, um, so our discussion, and, and we do the same. Uh, I mean, we're highly positive. Uh, we get out there, that's because we feed a, a large amount of information, and even in a negative environment like this, we look for the positive, but we know that we are still being affected by all those negative inputs, and we have a saying between ourselves, flip it. So if you come up with this answer, what's the flip side of it? Okay, so uh, just try and flip whatever it is and try and think of another way of actually dealing with that particular challenge. So, uh, you know, it, it, it can be quite ridiculous. Uh, someone might come in and turn around and say, um, oh, well, look, uh, retail stores. Do I get into retail stores now? Uh, is it the right timing? Um, and so why do people get into retail stores? Quite simply, if you go through and have a look at it, they expect that the, the malls, if they get into a mall, uh, the landlords will do a lot of work to attract the customers in. So they're prepared to pay a premium in terms of rentals to grab some of those customers that might come in. 
Well, what happens if those customers are locked down in their houses and they don't want to go out to, to malls anymore for at least the next 6, 12, 18 months? Well, if you are stuck into a three to five year lease, let's say, it's no good turning around and saying, well, look, I've got to shut my door down because you're going to lose a ton. What you want to try and do is turn around and say, okay, I've got this. How do I flip the challenge? Uh, can I take my store to the consumer? <laughs> or is there some way that I can work with all these retail operators and I can create some sort of concept that gets people social distancing and having a giggle? You know what I, you know what I saw that was so exciting? Peter Diamandis um, has been having a look at what's going on in the United States. And he decided last week to offer a million dollar challenge to 15 year olds to 24 year olds to come up with the most fashionable, effective mask. And in case viral pandemics are the way of the future. Uh, so there's a lot of talk that, that this COVID is just the beginning of a large number of viral pandemics. Now, if he's right, wouldn't we want an alternative to be in place? And he's willing to give away a million dollar prize to bunches of kids, and they've got to operate in groups between 15 to 24 to come up with a fashionable, fantastic mask that people will love to wear so that it reduces the risk of being exposed to any future viruses. This is the type of thinking that people have got to do. And we can do it right now, no matter how deep you are. In fact, I think the deeper you're in the poo, the more you need to hand your little baby over to Ian Johnson and put mm -hmm. it on the courtroom table and we start changing the nappy so that it, it just discombobulates your brain and makes you open up your thinking. I, I've got next door here, I've got an 11 year old. Uh, in fact, that's, that little baby is now an 11 year old, Ian. And she is sitting on a thing I don't understand. It's called a self, they call it a cell smartphone. <laughs> What's that thing? <clears throat> um, and she is playing away with all of her classmates that can't go to school at the moment because they're on forced, forced leave. Well, you can sit down and you can mope and you can turn around. It's, no, they're having a ball. And, and the other evening, she was on, oh, what do they call these things? Webinars. I don't understand this stuff. Um, but she was dealing with people in South America. In America. It's a, an 11-year-old. Now, this is, the time is too exciting. The trick is to, to take who you are, bottle the excitement. In, in fact, we talk of it being like bottled lightning. Okay. Um, how to actually come together with someone who understands the basics, take your excitement and put those two things together. And this is where Ian is so blooming good. He is the fixer. Okay. <laughs> That's why his series is called The Fixer. If you've got a problem, this boykey fixes those particular challenges. But he doesn't fix your challenge. He helps you fix your mindset. And that's why I was excited in actually collaborating with you. Thank now, you, Trevor. It's very kind of you. But I think, uh, as I said earlier, I said the foundation and the structure and the framework of the book is out of the confessions of serial entrepreneurs. So those are really good, valuable lessons that we've kind of just tweaked and added on to. And um, they, they just make so much sense because they just, they, they're so basic. But they're so powerful in, in, the, yep. in the fact that they're so basic and simple. And, and people tend to kind of look for the latest technology and the latest research from Harvard. And uh, at this time of our lives, I think it's getting back to basics. And, and, and right, positive attitude, it's, it's mindset, isn't it? I mean, you know, when you're really negative, it's really hard to get out of that. And you need to surround yourself with people that can feed you with this positive energy that kind of gets you out of that process. And it's a daily thing, you know, people have to work at it daily. It's that 1% rule. You know, if you're having doubts, if you've got a bit of negativity, then you need to make sure that you practice the two degree rule because if you carry on going the direction you're going, you're going to be so far off course, it's going to be really difficult for you to get back in. So 
even in mindsets, even in attitudes, a two degree and a one percent rule apply, and just just keep it simple. And 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 Ian, again, you remind me. It's not about work, working with people who have got Pollyanna ideas and off the wall and that sort of thing. It's about it's about surrounding yourself with positive people who have got different viewpoints. They come from uh, different industries. They see things from different points of view. Um, but if, uh, especially in today's time you must know that this has rocked the boat of almost everyone. So uh, if you're looking around, you're looking at these great buildings that, gone, uh, that have gone up in the center of Santon, do not for one moment think that the guy at the top of those buildings is not shivering at the moment. But you know why they will be successful and will see their way through. If they're operating in their businesses with integrity, and the people around them have been operating with integrity, right moral values, understanding that, that business is about sharing great value with your customer. They've got the basics right. And they know that they can work over a period of time and this market will come back to them over a period of time. In, in fact, uh, what this market will do is, is get rid of all the rubbish operators. Those that have been uh, mistreating their staff um, that have been um, ripping off the public, uh, just charging exorbitant prices and they're not giving any value anymore. I, th I think what's going to happen is we're going to have a cleaning out of quality business that is going to remain over a period of time. Will that get rid of all the corruption and all that sort of nonsense? I don't think so, uh, because people are going to have to survive, and you're going to have to be, and you're going to have to be watching who you're actually dealing with here, because uh, we're going to be exposed to many, many people. But that's where you need uh, to be able to understand, man, how can these people be offering me this product at that price or this deal or whatever? You need to understand the basics of a business uh, to be able to actually assess whether you should be deal, uh, doing a deal with that business operator or this business operator going forward. Sorry, Lee, I'm sure you've got questions. Um, I, so I'm, the question, I'm so not the talker. Mm. No, no, it's, this is all, I mean, talk about value. This Anybody that uh, is even vaguely on the edges of business are going to be uh, enraptured with, with what's being shared here because they, this is really, you talk about real, you talk about um, business lessons that really work. Uh, I mean, that's what I, I'm, I'm gauging from here. I, I'm going to wrap up now, but I, I want to emphasize something from the book that really stood out for me. And it's again, very applicable for this time is that throughout the book, besides these incredible stories and these get down to basics principles, there are questions after questions after questions. And the point of those questions is to get you out of the cycle of negative thinking and revolving down to the lowest common denominator and getting you to focus on these basics that will help you to, as you're saying, Ian, see the next step and then the next step and then the next step. And so uh, if there's anybody who is feeling uh, the world is literally on their heads uh, or they, their mind is muddled and, and they're feeling overwhelmed, this book will really pull you out of that place because these questions give you such clear, uh, not because they're telling you what to do, but because they're giving you this, the thinking to help you to think. <laughs> and, and, and that's how you start to pull out the one, two, three, the one, two, three things that I can do today, the one, two, three things that I need to do this week, the one, two, three things that are going to get me on track uh, in, in this environment. So I am really, I'm excited. I mean, I, I thought there were opportunities uh, before I was chatting to you uh, guys. Now I'm absolutely convinced 
that uh, it's just waiting. There's, there's just more waiting. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to end here, but Ian, final, final um, comments you want to make? Yeah, I think as Trevor said, I think that, um, you know, Trevor and I are very, very willing and, and, and to share information. You know, I think it's all we're in the information and sharing age. And, and I'm very happy to share this with people. And you know, Trevor's got, I think in the book, it's the 17 strategic marketing questions, which are really kind of, you read them and say, well, oh, okay, that's quite interesting. I've never really thought about that. When I first look at it, it seems pretty basic. When I actually read it, you know, you say, well, actually, that's quite interesting. Can I answer that question? And most cases you can't because you, we justify to ourselves what, what to do. And we're very good at justifying ourselves and not getting on with it. And Trevor's very good at asking questions that sometimes put people in an uncomfortable situation purely because they've never asked themselves that question. So I think, yeah, we're very happy to share that information. And uh, I think now's the time for people to, to reset, rethink, and um, as Trevor says, look around the bookshelves and find those little pearls of wisdom, whether it's Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Sex Successful People or The Richest Man in Babylon, the basic classics, uh, Napoleon Hill's Think Rich, Think and Grow Rich, they're classics. And they've all got a great message there that actually gets people to maybe get their mindset right. Thanks, Ian. Trevor? Final comments. I, def I definitely want to find that book, The Seven Models of Highly Sexy Rich People. <laughs> <laughs> that's, where I, that's where I thought Ian was going as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's why I like him as a partner. I must <laughs> um, but but, uh, but I, I, I cannot let uh, us uh, allow Ian to go away uh, without sharing one great story. And, and that was uh, how you got into the coffin business and how that applies to, to the mental attitude people have got to have today. Um, if, if you've got three minutes, Lee, this is a story that, that will help people in today's environment. Coffin story, do you remember that, Ian? <laughs> yes, I do. I was working for a, a big corporate organization. The, the main holding company was involved in coal exports. And um, they, went, they went down the tubes. They went insolvent. And there was a domino effect for all the other companies in the group. They also went one after the other. And I was with one of those companies. So in January of this, this particular year, I went back to work and found that the sheriff had locked the doors. So we had nowhere to go. So I got in my car and went home. And my wife says, what are you doing? I said, well, the doors are closed. The business is closed down. So I just started really using my contacts that I built up. Uh, I did a lot of traveling into Africa at the time. So I started making contact with people. And if anything stood for long enough, I would sell it, you know. And, and I was selling all little bits and pieces and some solo equipment and stuff. And then I got a, um, I got a, 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 a fax, I think it was, from, from a guy saying, I went uh, in the Congo, a fax. You know, I mean, it was a long time ago. And he said, yeah. um, do, you, do you sell or can you sell coffin accessory? So I went back to him and said, sure, that's my main line. I mean, that's what I do. <laughs> and uh, he, so he sent me a fax with a whole list of all these coffin accessories. So I said, well, that's interesting. So Mr. Google came into play and I found some company in the west of Germiston that did coffins, made all this sort of stuff. I got in my car and I drove to the other side of Germiston. And there was this huge like warehouse of coffins and accessories and crucifixes and handled, grabbed a catalog from them, got a price list and went home and says, right, now what do you want? <laughs> and, and then I started selling mainly crucifixes and handles and all sorts of stuff, which was, which was big business. So uh, as, as um, Richard Branson said, the answer is yes. What is the question? <laughs> I just said, yes, I, I that's my main business, and then why don't find you can supply me this stuff? And it was a whole new world walking around like that. I was like, oh, I said, wow, this is a bit creepy. <laughs> but but you, you know what? As funny as that story is, um, the opportunities today are just exponentially more advanced 
than the opportunity that Ian had to do there. Imagine uh -huh. getting in your car all the way to there and faxing and all this sort of, on the internet, we can do this millions of times, uh, literally billions of times. Um, so, man, you, there's no shortage of opportunity. Yes, the times are tough. Um, but what you should be doing, I think, is saying yes to yourself. Okay, now I'm going to do it. I'm going to go and meet with guys who are positive um, and, and who know that, that times are tough, but we're going to look for solutions. We're going to find out what you're damn good at. And maybe, uh, you know, it, it wasn't that Ian was um, ripping people off about something he didn't know. He went very quickly and started to become an expert in that particular field and delivered the value that these people want. And they wouldn't have bought it if the price wasn't right. All the elements of business. Yeah, and I think that you just I, end, I think um, people um, people need to, you know, people can come onto the Four Ways Chamber meetings on a Friday and the, the early morning ones. I think those are areas that people can really get stimulated. They can have a change of mindset. They can listen to other people, get some ideas. And I think that the Four Ways Chamber is a great platform for them to to really use at this particular time. And I think it's a valuable tool and asset for them to, to get involved in. Brilliant. We better shut up here. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. You guys, honestly, I, uh, I, I, it's going to be amazing. I can't wait to, to, to put this out uh, into the universe, as they say, uh, because I know that there are people who will watch this and their lives will be changed. And um, so thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the book. Um, and, uh, and we will post how people can get hold of the book. So it will be available. And uh, so thank you for your time. It's been great to spend this time with you and uh, look forward to great things ahead. Thanks, Thanks. Lee. Thanks, Trev. Speak to Cheers, Lee. Cheers, Bye. Good in your coffins. <laughs>